when it comes to the Great Lakes, um, you the percentage of movement that that's seen right now. What is that like? Well, I mean, it, it, it's very, very significant in terms of volume. Uh, you know, there's 40 million residents that uh, live here in the Great Lakes Basin, the majority Americans, but also about 10 million Canadians. Um, the overall capacity uh, in North America is much larger. Ab about 20% of all of North American capacity is here in the Great Lakes Basin. About 80% of it is elsewhere. Uh, but nonetheless, it is a, a very, very significant volume of crude that's moved to the region and refined here, or uh, crude that moves through the region to refinery operations uh, primarily east of the Great Lakes Basin. And when it comes to movement, how does it move? The large majority, roughly, well, it's, it's well over 90% of, uh, of, of unrefined uh, hydrocarbons or, or crude gets moved through pipeline. And it's a, a pipelines are a, are a high capital investment, but a relatively low operating cost method to move unrefined products. Uh, so over 90% moved by pipeline, and then a much smaller proportion, roughly 5% by rail. And then there's very, very small proportion that might be moved by, uh, by road, uh, by, by tanker truck, but that's very rare. And then in the Great Lakes themselves, there is no movement on water. So there's no vessels, no ships, no ships okay. transporting unrefined uh, or, or crude uh, hydrocarbon products. Uh, there are ships that move uh, limited quantities of refined fuels, uh, including in their own gas tanks, essentially, to power those vessels. Um, there is some crude moved by ship uh, down downstream in the, in the St. Lawrence River area, but in the Great Lakes there is no crude moved by, uh, by water. So how common is it for a spill or for a, a whoopsie to happen when it comes to all this movement? Well, th 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 there's sort of two sides to that issue. The, the, the first is the, the, the likelihood of a, of, a, of a spill or a loss of containment. For modern infrastructure that's well maintained, you know, pipeline, rail, etc., the likelihood of a loss of containment is very small. Uh, it tends not to happen very often, but the other side of the discussion, the risk discussion, is the severity of impact. Because these are high volume transport methods, when a spill does occur, there's usually quite severe impact. So risk is sort of a balance of the likelihood of, of, of release and the severity of impact. And because although it's low likelihood, it's high severity, that moves it well up the risk continuum. So, you know, we've seen that with, uh, with, uh, with Line 6B in, in Kalamazoo. Uh, we've seen that just outside of the basin in, in Lac uh, Magantic in, in Quebec. So when these events do occur, they, they are very serious. Uh, and, and so, you know, we need to obviously continue to address it diligently and thoroughly. Right. When it comes to likelihood, obviously the likelihood would be low if the infrastructure is maintained and updated. What happens if it's not? And how often or how many lines out there um, fall under that category of not being maintained or worse, carrying some sort of product that it's not designed for? Well, I'm not the person to answer that question thoroughly. What I, what I would observe is that in both countries, in the, the, uh, the uh, pipeline construction and operation are federally regulated. In, in, in Canada, it's, uh, it's the National Energy Board. In the U.S., it's PHMSA, the Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration. Um, those are, you know, highly evolved agencies, you know, with, with a lot of competent people working with industry to ensure infrastructure is properly designed and built and, and well operated and maintained. Does the system always work? No. We, we know that from, from the events that have happened, but it is a pretty good system, but you've got to continually strive to improve those systems. And, uh, you know, FIMSA or NEB could answer your question better, but that, those would be my comments. Okay. So when it comes to the IGC, I know um, you put up a list in your presentation on, on some of the things that need to be addressed and some of the things that you guys are working on addressing. Um, well, you know, cross-border communication. Can you go over some of those things yeah, that, that yeah. will sort of help move us forward yeah. toward a situation that makes folks feel a little bit more secure? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, first of all, I would just observe that, that the International Joint Commission, which is, is not a regulatory agency, we were established through treaty over 100 years ago as an independent Commission to advise both federal governments, and we usually have something to say to the states and the provinces as well. 
Uh, we provide science-based advice to those to those levels of government. We work closely with a number of other organizations uh, across a number of sectors through an, a number of different partnerships to try to advance this very important issue. So it's, it's complicated. But we, we do have a small role to play relative to some of that science advice. And so we took a close look at the issue of spills of hydrocarbons, mostly refined products, petroleum, uh, as well as some other chemicals in the, uh, in the Huron Erie Corridor, which is sort of the St. Clair River, uh, Lake St. Clair, Detroit River area. And that was about 10 years ago. We had a close look at those, those issues where there were some spills in, in, in a short period of time. And we found that in many cases, um, what was required to try to mitigate uh, the likelihood of spills and then the response to those spills is improved coordination between the two countries. And it's coordination of, uh, of, 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 of science information, of data warehousing. So there's a single repository to go and get information on spills, their toxicity, you know, their, the, the, and, and some of the potential impacts because of the importance of drinking water intakes along that particular corridor the importance of having real-time monitoring systems and and notification and response systems that can respond very quickly to a spill event so drinking water is not affected etc these were some of the coordination issues we've identified and you know in my opinion the governments have made progress in some of these areas for example we have a series of committees around the Great Lakes water quality agreement that have been struck a few years ago that are improving communication and coordination um, we also uh, we also identified through that um, through that effort that uh, spill response could be could be better coordinated and and so coordination was a really important sort of outcome of our analysis of that effort. A more recent effort, which is ongoing, and it's much more science-based, our science advisory board is having a close look at the uh, water quality and ecological impacts of spills of crude or unrefined products here in the Great Lakes. And that's been an interesting effort, and although we're, it's still ongoing, so we'll have more to say in due course, perhaps uh, as early as the early part of 2018. But what we're finding there uh, uh, is relative to science information, on toxicity and water quality and ecological impacts is that there's much more information on our marine or, 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 or saltwater systems than freshwater systems here in the lakes. So that's an area that, you know, is uh, re requiring a, a additional research is around the freshwater environments. We're finding that uh, in, in some of the groups of species are much better understood in terms of their vulnerability and sensitivity to spills than others. So for example, fish and birds tend to have been studied much more than than reptiles and amphibians, some right. of the smaller I saw the critters. On your list. And yeah, that's like, right. Oh, no. Yeah, and these are really important yeah. organisms yeah. that play an important role in you know in our in the ecology of the system, mm -hmm. uh, but the, but they're not as well understood. We're also finding that where we do have information on toxicity to organisms and 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 impacts on water quality, that it tends to be much more the short-term impacts, the so-called acute impacts, acute toxicity, the toxicity, and the response of organisms with within minutes or, or hours or days of a, of a spill event, whereas the, the chronic or sublethal impacts, the impacts that would occur to organisms that survive the initial spill, but the impacts that would occur over months or years to, to individuals or populations are, are less well understood. So we need to get a better handle on that. And so these were some of the sorts of findings that we think are important to fill. And the reason that it's important to have this information is that it allows uh, uh, it to be applied in a number of different ways. For example, good science information around the sensitivity of coastal systems, coastal wetlands, to an oil spill, for example, which is something we're looking at, would be helpful information in terms of siting mm -hmm. infrastructure. You know, you don't site refineries or pipelines or ports or whatever where there's particularly sensitive habitats. Uh, also, the operation of pipelines uh, and other infrastructure um, can be very uh, can be influenced by the availability of good science information. And then, very importantly, if there is a loss of containment or a spill, cleanup can be in, in influenced by good science information. You know. Where are those sensitive habitats? Where are those sensitive species? How do we need to consider that information in prioritizing the actions that we do take immediately following a spill? And so, you know, much of the effectiveness of, of response actions is influenced by the resources and the information that you have right at your fingertips when those spill responders are getting going in the hours after a spill. And so we want to, you know, we want to apply the information that way too.